Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to our house. I want to welcome you to a little bit of a view of our backyard. I don't know how much you can see back there, but uh, there's a little snow flying, already some on the ground, and they are saying that more is on the way. So happy snowy Valentines. Hope you've remembered in your rush to get ready for this snow that today is also Valentine's Day. And since we are having a snow day, so to speak, and we couldn't meet together at our building, I'm going to interrupt our series on hope. And I'm gonna lead us in a study about love since it's Valentine's Day. So I hope you have a Bible and I hope you'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Or really just turn to 1 Corinthians because um, in just a moment we're going to go back and we're going to look at some other things in the book of 1 Corinthians before we um, settle down and look at 1 Corinthians 13 this morning in our lesson. The name of our lesson today is Why Love is the Greatest Thing About Christianity. Why Love is the Greatest Thing About Christianity. We'll take just a moment or two and let a few more people get logged in and see our broadcast this morning. Again, we're um, not able to meet at our normal place, the church building, but we uh, have been doing so because there is inclement weather, there is ice and snow, and the roads are already treacherous, and there is more on the way. And so welcome in, glad to see many of you who are already tuned in. I wanna tell you a little bit about our schedule today so you'll know what is going on. Here in the next few minutes, we're going to study the Bible together in our sermon time. But uh, around 10.30, um, look for another broadcast from the Waterview Facebook page. Brother Robert Taylor is going to lead us in a communion service. So hope you have some items there to be able to observe the Lord's Supper. We'll do that together as best we can at around 1030. And then once that is over, then around 1045, tune back in, refresh this page one more time. And Brother Jim Alexander will join us with some news about our congregation and to lead us in a shepherd's prayer. So I hope you have your Bible. You're ready to look at the book of 1 Corinthians. Before we ever get to 1 Corinthians 13 and, and talk about love, there is a great principle that Paul had applied to the troubled Corinthian church. And I want to see how he applies this principle, this thought, this solution, if you will, as he goes about addressing some of the real issues that this church had. Paul helped establish this church, so he felt like he was a father to this church. So I think he felt like he could speak to them uh, more forcefully and more passionately. And of course, that's what he seems to do throughout the book of 1 Corinthians. And so one of the first things he addresses in the Corinthian letter is the fact that they were fussing and they were fighting. And there were factions and some were claiming well, you know, Paul is our leader. Others were saying Apollos is. Some were saying Peter is. Others were saying Jesus is. First Corinthians chapter 1, about verse 12. But then he addresses this situation and he, he reprimands them in chapter 3, uh, around verse 3. He says, you're being immature about this. And then he starts pointing to the one who really deserved all of the glory for the church existing, for the church being what it is. And if the church ever grows, it will grow because God gives the increase. He says that in verses six and seven. So more or less, he says, all this fussing and fighting, the real solution to that is to always look to God and to know that God is the one who should get all of the glory and all of the credit. He goes on to address another serious issue in chapter 5, there was actually a man who was sleeping with, having sexual relations with his mother-in-law. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. And there were others apparently that had dabbled in prostitution, according to chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. 
And you know what Paul's recommendation for them is to address this issue in the church? I want you to look at this with me in the, the last couple of verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is what he says. He says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Once again, the solution to the issue is look to God. And in this case, glorify God. If you're having divisions in the church and it's becoming about personalities, look to God, glorify God. If you're struggling with sexual ethics, glorify God in your body. Look to God. He addresses another issue. Beginning in chapter 7, he really begins to tackle several things that they had written to him about. They had written to him with questions, and so he starts to, to answer some of those questions in chapters 7 through 10. He asked, they had asked him questions about marriage and divorce and eating and drinking and Paul gives a response to each of those topics, but he sums up the Christian philosophy for dealing with these issues in chapter 10 and verse 31, when he says, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. There that principle is again, the idea of glorifying God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he addresses the problem of them um, abusing the, the, the observance of the Lord's Supper. They they didn't quite understand what they should be doing, and some of them were um, abusing this, this beautiful Christian ceremony that Jesus Christ himself had instituted. And, and there in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul refers to the institution that Jesus had made for the Lord's Supper. And he told them in verse 27, he says, some of you were doing this in an unworthy manner. They were taking the Lord's Supper selfishly and not in accord with the manner uh, that Jesus had instituted. And so they weren't remembering Jesus. They were thinking about themselves. They weren't giving God and Jesus the glory. There it is again, the idea that this problem could be corrected by just glorifying God. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul addresses one of the most serious issues they had the misuse of spiritual gifts. He really does this in chapters 12, 13, and 14. In reality, we're going to come back to 13 here in just a moment, but they were misusing the spiritual gifts that this church had been blessed to have. They were being selfish about it. They were being haughty about it. They were, they were actually forgetting in the individual gifts that they had, that they were a part of a process, that they were part of the body of Christ. And all of this was to work together to do what? Guess what? To glorify God. Paul even says, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. In other words, the way he wanted it, and of course, for it to be to his glory, we might say. The church is about glorifying God not us. And even in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul instructed them about the importance of the resurrection. Obviously, there was some misunderstanding about the most basic foundational principle of Christianity, the resurrection of Jesus. So he instructed them about Christ's resurrection about, and about their future resurrection. And he reminded them that in the resurrection of the dead, he says, what is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. He says, it is sown, the, the body is sown in dishonor, but it is raised, here's our word, in glory. It is sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it's raised in power, verses 42 and 43. And remember, the whole resurrection is designed to bring glory to God because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, why not take the time to highlight these problems that the Corinthian church had before we go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13? And as you notice, as I was highlighting all these problems, I skipped over 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 actually fits very nicely with Paul's solution to all the problems that this church had. At the end of discussing how they were struggling with their spiritual gifts, in 
Chapter 12, 31. Actually, the, the, the last few words of chapter 12 before you get into chapter 13. And some say that really the, the, those who divided up the verses in the chapters, they should have included these words with chapter 13 instead of the end of chapter 12. But in the last few words of chapter 12, in dealing with how they're struggling with the spiritual gifts, selfishness and sin and all of that, Paul says to them, I will show you a still more excellent way. That's what the ESV says. It reads a little clunky to me. The NIV simply says, I will show you the most excellent way. Those are Paul's words leading into what we know to be this beautiful chapter, a chapter describing love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In a church where the gifts of the Spirit were being used with the wrong spirit, Paul takes them back to the basics, and he says the fruit of the Spirit is love. We know what Galatians 5 says. The first thing about the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And so what he does is he teaches the church the greatest thing they could ever learn, and that is why love is the greatest thing about Christianity. And so if you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, real briefly, we want to take a look at three reasons why love is the greatest thing about Christianity. These are all real easy to learn, real easy even to remember. I will warn you, they're not as easy to practice. Some have said that this is one of the most beautiful chapters in the Word of God, but then others have come along right behind that and said, but these are some of the least practiced words in the Word of God. So what do we need to know concerning why love is the greatest thing about Christianity? Number one, love is essential. Love is essential. If you're there, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, let's, let's read the first three verses when Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. And so you might ask, why does Paul start here? Well, the Corinthian Christians like drama. They like dramatic experiences. They love supernatural gifts like speaking in tongues and miracles and healings. They were real self-centered and self-indulgent about those things. That's what was causing part of the problem here. And you know, this flowed out of the Greek cultic religions. No wonder they struggled with this. Culture impacts us. Culture changes the way we think from time to time. We know that Corinth was a city in ancient Greece famous, or infamous, I guess you'd say, for their sexual immorality. No wonder this is impacting the church there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul has to speak about that. But it was also a place where the Greek mystery religions were very, very popular. Those religions attracted people looking for spiritual experiences. The people participated in them um, were used to being moved, you might say. They had trances, and they often believed they were transported out of their body. And this was regarded as pretty normal for these mystery religions. Not only that, the only way you really knew that you were a part of that was if these things were happening to you. And so it's no wonder Paul starts off by mentioning some of the Christian spiritual gifts that the Corinthian church possessed. He, he says these are the things they valued the most, like speaking in tongues. That's the thing that they were all up and, and excited about. If they could speak in tongues, and, and Paul explains to them, you know, this is not really the, the best spiritual gift. Prophecy is the best spiritual gift. Uh, that's another discussion, I guess. But he says, you know, you value speaking in tongues and prophecy. And you value 
knowledge. You value mysteries. You value having enough faith to do spectacular things. Remember, they were into the spectacular. But, but here's the problem. Paul had a suspicion, and I think he was right, that there wasn't a lot of love in the way that they were using these spiritual gifts. So his whole point is, it doesn't matter how great your spiritual gift really is. And it doesn't matter how great your spiritual sacrifice might be unless it's done in love. I mean, Paul says some things here that should make us think. You may say, well, you know, I, I can't speak in tongues. So this thing about, you know, speaking with the tongues of men and angels, and um, that, that doesn't really apply to me. Well, in a way, it, it kind of does. Fancy speech, eloquent speech, it may sound real good, but if there's not love behind it, it's just the same. Paul says, if, if that is the case, you're like a noisy gong or a, a clanging cymbal. Uh, he goes on to say something here that maybe should catch our attention even more. He says, if you've got the kind of faith that can move mountains, and uh, that, that was probably a, a way of indicating doing marvelous things in religion, this would have been something that they would have probably reasoned as, if you've got enough faith to do marvelous things, powerful things, miraculous things even, uh, in those days they could do those things. He says, if you do those things, but you don't have love, you're nothing. And this should really catch our attention the most. He says, if you give, you, you, let's say you've got money and you start giving things away, but if you don't do it for the right reason, you have nothing. And this is the one that should catch our attention the most. He says, if, if you deliver up your body to be burned, in, in other words, if you're willing to lay down your life for your religion, but it's not done for the right reason, this being love. He says, what does it matter? There, there was, it is said, a, a statue there in Athens of uh, one person who supposedly allowed themselves to be burned up for the sake of their religion. And so that was celebrated. So a lot of people in those days thought if you could give your life, if you would be willing to lay down your life for your particular religion, then that was good enough to grant you entrance into whatever you thought was coming. And so now there were Christians in, in the church in the first century, and there have been Christians in every century since that they stood up so much for their faith that they lost their lives. They martyred themselves for the cause of Christ. But if you seek to do that just for the sake of doing that, if you seek out persecution that really doesn't have to be persecution, if you seek to lay down your life when you really don't have to lay down your life, I think this is what Paul's talking about. He says, it's nothing. If you don't do it for the right reason, if you don't do it for love, and so I think all of that needs to be remembered. And, and this is what Paul is saying here. The reason love is the greatest thing about Christianity is because it keeps us grounded in God's greatest characteristic, love. Love should cause us to ask, why do I do what I do? And if the answer isn't love, then it's the wrong answer. And this is why love is essential the Christianity. Number two, love is also embodied. If you want to know why love is the greatest thing about Christianity, it is something that you actually can do. We love these verses, verses four through seven, which describe love. Let's read them together, where Paul says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. We love these verses, and we believe that they are some of the most beautiful in all of the Bible. And you know why we believe that? 
I think it's because we know that this is describing who God is. You can read this part of the chapter, verses 4 through 7, and everywhere you read the word love, you can just insert God. God is patient and kind. God does not envy or boast. God is not arrogant or rude. God does not insist on its own way. God is not irritable or resentful. It's describing perfect love, agape love. This is not passionate love. This is not friendship love. Those things have always existed. We know all about those things, but this is perfect agape love. This is the kind of love that seeks to do the best for others and does not seek it, its own glorification or interest. That's what agape love is. It's describing who God is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't do it for himself. He did it for us. And, and so the, the powerful image here is that this is something that not only God is, but also this is something that you can be as well. And that's what's so powerful about this because God is love, but he wants his people to be love as well. Everywhere the word love is mentioned in this passage, not only could you substitute the name, the word God with the name, the, the word love rather, with the name God, you could also do that with your name. When I do premarital counseling, I read this passage with couples and, and I tell them, okay, this is describing what love really is, how love really acts, because this is an act. This is a conscious decision to act a certain way. And, and I challenge them to read this passage with their name in the place of love. And I, I challenge them to realize if they do that, if they do that, they'll solve 99% of all the problems that they will ever face. And you know, what I really love about this, when, when we think about this more practically, one of the things about love that makes Christianity so great is this gives us purpose. This gives us something to do. Sometimes Christians wonder, okay, what can I do? We know what God's done. We know how much he loves us and how he has given so much for us. He's given all for us. But sometimes we, we're, we perhaps wonder, what's my purpose in this world? Well, here is something that you can do. This is something you can embody. You can be loved. Notice that Paul doesn't say love is like this. He says love is this. This is something that you can do. What better purpose can you and I have than to embody how God really is? and how he really wants us to be. And you know what? Remember, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. He is saying the church at Corinth needs to be known for love. I don't think at that point they were known for that, but they needed to be known for love. So love is not just essential. Love is not just something you can embody. But here's the third reason that love is the greatest thing about Christianity. It's because love is eternal. Let's read these last few verses, the last part of this chapter, very quickly together, where Paul says, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. And then he goes on to talk about how these spiritual gifts would come to pass. And then he concludes the chapter with saying, now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. I told you we're going to take a detour from our lessons on hope, but right here at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, we're reminded of three great things, faith, hope, and love. But Paul says the greatest of these is love. Why does he say that? It's because faith one day will become sight. It's because hope one day will be attained. We'll see that. We'll experience that. But the real reason is love is the greatest thing about Christianity because it is something that's going to continue. Paul tells us that love is the only thing that is eternal. On the day of judgment, our knowledge will be useless. Paul says it puffs up, 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Our success, money, and fame, those things won't matter. It won't matter if we've been good or religious. It won't even matter if we've been a Christian unless, Paul says, unless you have done that with love. Love lasts. Love never ends. 
1 Corinthians 13 is the high water mark of seeking the glory of God. I told you that Paul's recommendation to fix these problems was to seek out the glory of God. And 1 Corinthians 13 is the high water mark of doing that. Practicing the love of God is the most excellent way to glorify God. It's been said, love is the signature of God himself in the hearts of all the redeemed. So I want to encourage you to keep on practicing love on this Valentine's Day. Thank you for joining us today for this sermon time. Uh, tune right back in here in just a couple of minutes for our communion service. I hope you have a great, warm, and blessed day.